How will U.S. and German tanks help Ukraine in its war against Russia? Berlin and Washington are sending Leopard and Abrams models to Kyiv. Russia calls the move a provocation. But will such new weaponry change the course of the conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Both Germany and the U.S. have agreed to send tanks to Ukraine. Berlin will supply its Leopard 2s and Washington the M1 Abrams. After resisting for weeks, Germany finally gave in to political pressure. It's also agreed to allow other countries, such as Poland and Finland, to send Leopard 2 tanks from their arsenals. They're considered essential for Ukraine if it's to take back territory captured by Russia early in the war. President Volodymyr Zelensky wants 300 tanks and has been asking NATO member states for the weapons. It looks like he'll eventually get 88 from Germany and another 31 from the U.S. So, will this turn the war in Ukraine's favor? Our correspondent Zain Bazravi has this report. It is being called a game changer for Ukraine. Berlin agreeing to supply its Leopard 2 tanks. Speaking to reporters from a military training facility in East Germany, Defense Minister Boris Pistorius is pressed on when they will arrive in country. So can you get the tanks to Ukraine? At the end of the first quarter of the year. And that's what we are going to do. Yeah, how many months? Two, three, four? No, I just said at the, end of, uh, at the end of March, I think. Is that in time because Ukrainians expect a Russian offensive to be imminent? All I know is that is in time. Earlier this week, Germany approved the delivery of hundreds of Leopard 2 tanks in EU arsenals to Kyiv, in the first stage of the latest NATO push to send more heavy weapons. What Ukrainian commanders say they need, along with more ammunition, before the winter thaw, and an expected Russian spring offensive. Getting those vehicles will improve their ability to take ground, uh, but, but it, I, I would be a little cautious about assuming that with them, they will conquer the world. The U.S. is sending dozens of its M1 Abrams tanks and the U.K. 14 of its Challenger 2s. They will add to hundreds of Russian T-72s already in Ukrainian military service. Moscow sees the development as Western countries becoming directly involved in the war and one that will lead to what it describes as permanent escalation. The success of tanks on land in European conflicts has historically relied on air support. And that is exactly what Ukraine's president says it needs next. Long-range missiles, more artillery, and crucially, modern military aircraft, if it is to take back the skies over Ukraine. Zain Basravi for Inside Story. On Wednesday, President Joe Biden announced the U.S. will send 31 Abrams tanks to support Kyiv. The Abrams tanks are the most capable tanks in the world. <clears throat> They're also extremely complex to operate and maintain. So we're also giving Ukraine the parts and equipment necessary to effectively sustain these tanks on the battlefield. And we begin, we'll begin to train the Ukrainian troops on these issues of sustainment, logistics, and maintenance as soon as possible. Delivering these tanks to the field is going to take time, time uh, that we'll see uh, we'll use to make sure the Ukrainians are fully prepared to integrate the Abram tanks into their defenses. A spokesperson for Russian President Vladimir Putin says that plans by the U.S. and Germany to send tanks to Ukraine are a direct involvement in the war. Dmitry Peskov said on Thursday that both European capitals and Washington keep saying that the delivery of various kinds of weapons systems, including tanks, to Ukraine absolutely does not mean the involvement of these countries or the NATO alliance and the hostilities ongoing in Ukraine. We categorically disagree with that. Moscow views everything that the alliance and the capitals I have mentioned are doing as direct involvement in the conflict. We can see it growing. All right, for more on all this, I'm joined by our guests. In Moscow is Pavel Felgenhauer, an independent defense and military analyst. In Brussels is Theresa Fallon, director of the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. And in Berlin is Olaf Bernke. Berlin director of Rasmussen Global, a political consultancy firm. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Uh, Teresa, let me start with you today. How significant is this decision by the U.S. and Germany to send tanks to Ukraine? And does this constitute a turning point in the conflict? Well, there's been a great deal of diplomatic wrangling going on. 
even within Germany, there was a lot of divisions. We saw Annalena Baerbach uh, making statements that were different than Chancellor Schultz's. So I, I think it's a very positive signal that they finally agreed to do this. It would have been much better if they had agreed to do this months ago because we timing is everything and it will take a long time to get this uh, to Ukraine, including the U.S. Abrams tanks. It will take you know, a few months to get those up there. So uh, the spring offensive is coming and everyone's quite concerned about this. But I think that at the end of the day, we have to remember, you know, Germany has a lot of obstacles and that they are making some movement. And that's a really positive uh, sign. Let's remember the low starting point. They initially just wanted to send 5,000 helmets. So now we've got them agreeing to send leopard tanks, which also means other countries in Europe can send the leopard tanks. So I think that this is a huge uh, sign. And I, I know that uh, Ukraine's uh, President Zelensky has said he needs at least 300. So this is just starting. So I think that uh, it's a very positive sign. And I hope that uh, other countries will continue to support Ukraine. Uh, Pavel, what's the view in Moscow about uh, all of this? I mean, how concerned is Russia about uh, the pledging of these tanks and the delivery uh, of these tanks? And, and are we going to see Russia take, take countermeasures? Uh, well, there's kind of two messages. One is more for the internal uh, Russian public, uh, Russian different military specialists uh, connected to the uh, authorities are saying that these tanks will be uh, destroyed by the Russian military, that this will not change the overall balance of power, not so many of them, and they can be destroy destroyed, and of course they can. That's not the question, but how effective they will be, that's an open question. The other message is going more abroad, that this is a dangerous escalation, that the West is getting involved, and this is very dangerous because Russia is a nuclear superpower, and if defeated on the battlefield, could they do something drastic, and there have been different kinds of threats that Russia will destroy these tanks. It's not clear how and where, because Russia does not really have the means conventionally to destroy them until they appear on the battlefield, uh, actually, because Russian attacks deep in Ukraine do happen, of course, but they are not that uh, hitting moving targets is not really in the Russian capacity very much of the Russian military. So uh, right now they're fretting, they're preparing, everyone's preparing for coming big battles because it's understood that the, on the battlefield right now will be decided how the further sort of the situation in Ukraine is going to develop. Uh, Olaf, um Obviously, th this was a difficult decision for Chancellor Schultz. When it comes to Germany, uh, could you walk us through how significant a move this is? Uh, you know, to allow another country to use German Leopard 2 tanks to fight Russians in a war in Europe. How big a deal is that for Germany right now? It is a very, very big deal, specifically for the party of the Chancellor Scholz. Or as uh, Theresa mentioned, not only the Greens, also the coalition partner, the Liberal FDP, was very supportive for delivery of tanks um, for weeks now. But the SPD actually is perceived as the party which of Willy Brandt actually was always arguing for we need uh, peace with Russia, we need conversations with Russia, so the diplomatic um, approach is the right way to go. Significantly, there's um, the party, the SPD, published on Monday a new white paper on the new foreign policy, and it's worth looking just in the section where they define their new relationship to Russia. If you read the manifesto from the Bundestag election one and a half years ago of the SPD, it still says there will be no peace in Europe without Russia. So for the very first time now, they made a 180 U-turn. And in this new paper, they say we need for peace in Europe, a peace against Russia. So and they apologize indirectly for all the false assumptions in the past years uh, towards Putin and mm. his regime. So, and this is one of the reasons why the chancellor was so eager to be backed by the solidarity of the US and his European allies to mm. do this only as a team effort. Uh, Olaf, if I could follow up with you. I mean, uh, there has been so much pressure on Germany to send these tanks. Was Chancellor Schultz's decision ultimately contingent upon the U.S. agreeing to send tanks? Is that what really clinched the deal on this? Of course, he didn't say so in public, but from all, sir, it is 
more than a coincidence that the U.S. government announced the very same moment the, uh, he announced actually that Germany will make pave the way for the Leopard 2 tanks, not just from Germany, but as Theresa mentioned, also for many European allies, um, that they will send Abraham tanks, even if we know that some of those have not even produced yet and would, might take years actually to deliver them to Ukraine. So it was uh, a huge deal. And uh, it seems that the reason why it took so long also um, and uh, the defense minister, uh, Lloyd Austin, actually spent a lot of time in the chancellery, as we learned from, from some leaked press news uh, last week before heading to Rammstein for that conversation. And in the end, so the German government made its way and uh, they are there, but it's really very important also for the uh, for the German people, if you look into surveys from today, actually, so people are backing in majority the decision, but they are also very afraid, actually, of a further escalation of the war by this decision. Uh, Teresa, you know, you were talking earlier about what kind of uh, equipment and aid was being pledged initially to Ukraine versus what's being pledged now. Um, you know, sending these M1 Abrams tanks to Ukraine, this is a big reversal of policy for the U.S. And, and many say that this move would have been unthinkable just months ago. I mean, we were just talking to Olaf about the German side of, of this equation. But on the U.S. side, was this decision by President Biden made essentially to convince Germany to send their tanks? As Olaf mentioned, it's the, the way it was portrayed in the news. First, Germany announced it, and then shortly afterwards, uh, President Biden announced it. So this is a reversal also in U.S. policy. So I think that that sends a very positive signal, but it takes a lot more time for the Abrams to, to get to Europe. First of all, uh, they have to be built. Many of them, there aren't many in storage or that can be just released. And as Olaf has pointed out, you know, this will take some time also, you know, moving them all the way to Europe. So I think that the fact that countries in Europe want to release their leopards to Ukraine is an important signal. But I think there is so much frustration um, in regard to Chancellor Schultz. I mean, there was a lot of you know, protests within Germany. There's all sorts of dialogue within Germany about this. And time is of the essence. So as Olaf pointed out, the SPD is, is traditionally more friendly towards, towards Russia. So I think that this is also kind of the closing of an era. And with the announcement of the Zeitenwende, this you know, change, some people have described it more as like slaloming down a mountain. It's not so much as a turning point as, you know, kind of moving around, trying to find uh, the center of gravity. And I think this war has lasted longer than anybody in Berlin ever envisioned. So I think that as President Zelensky said, he needs a lot more tanks, he needs more artillery, he's going to start asking for planes. I don't know if, if that will happen or not, but I think it's important for Ukraine to win at this point. Uh, the message is quite clear that the West is united, despite some kerfuffles. And in addition, you know, Russia's use of threatening the use of nuclear weapons, it, you know, the West is not being, is not kowtowing to that. And that sends an important message also to Beijing that this kind of idle threat of nuclear weapons is designed to scare people from and make them uh, have inaction. But there is some analysis that uh, by Schultz insisting that the U.S. send the Abrams, it kind of signaled, I mean, this is one analyst view that uh, that they're covered by the U.S. nuclear weapon, uh, by nuclear defense, but they're already covered through NATO. So I think that uh, that's one analysis that Germany wanted to have this kind of doing it together with the U.S. Mm -hmm. to show that they're united and that they have coverage because they're on the ground there and they are fearful of any sort of escalation and Russian rhetoric is, can be quite frightening. Uh, Pavel, uh, Teresa was just speaking there about Russian rhetoric uh, leading up to this moment uh, and, and in the past since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, um, the potential use of, of nuclear weapons, um, uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and I'm curious to get your viewpoint on this. Do, do you think we'll be hearing more about nuclear weapons going forward? Well, there have been pronouncements from uh, including Russian officials like uh, former President Dmitry Medvedev, who's now also still a high official in the Kremlin, uh, talking about uh, the possibility of an escalation, that uh, defeat in conventional warfare would be unacceptable, and Russia is a nuclear superpower, and it can go non-conventional. 
Uh, that's what really nuclear power has been, nuclear weapons have been used since 1945 as a deterrent and for brinkmanship to threaten nuclear possible escalation, to find ways to curtail uh, conventional losses or at least conventional threats. Uh, so the nuclear blackmail is normal. That's how nuclear weapons have been used all the time. But actually going from there over the nuclear threshold is a totally different story actually using them. Because any use of nuclear weapons would not bring really Russia any political or military dividends at all. Um, attacking Ukrainian troops on the battlefield could not bring much. There are not any large concentrations and Russian uh, troops and the Russian territory is nearby. Attacking uh, Europe or the United States, well, then there's going to be a response. And then you owe out nuclear war that will totally destroy Russia and actually the Russian nation will be wiped out. So I believe, and that's most likely the analysis that's coming from other places, and actually, the Kremlin in the last resort is also saying that this is not really happening, that the nature of the operation is not changing. So I don't think it's, good. it's moving right now from uh, brinkmanship, mm -hmm. from blackmail to usage. Mm. Uh, Pavel, I just want to follow up with you about another uh, issue. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that Russia is going to be preparing for the coming big battles. Uh, and, and I'm curious, uh, do you believe that the potential arrival of these tanks is going to cause Russia to significantly change its tactics on the battlefield? Well, of course, they'll be taken into account. Uh, though there are many uh, factors happening there. There's a lot of talk in the West about a spring offensive, but that's not happening. There will be no spring offensive. In March, you can't fight in those places in Ukraine. You'll just drown in mud. That's how, what happened with the Russians last year in March. Uh, so if there's going, there can be uh, escalation right now in mm -hmm. the coming week or two. That's possible. While it's still cold and, and even there's maybe frost there down there. And uh, there could be really big fighting already when things begin to dry up. That's end of April, May. Well, technically, maybe that's spring, but that's already really the summer campaign. And if nothing happens drastic right now in the coming two weeks, that means everyone's going to be uh, moving and thinking about the summer, big summer, summer campaign and preparing forces mm -hmm. and reserves, which is happening basically right now. There's also a lot of disinformation being sent around by all sides because war is deceit. Mm -hmm. And that, even everyone who wants to attack will, will uh, try to convince everyone else that he is not attacking. Uh, Olaf, the, the Leopard 2 tanks uh, that have been pledged, um, it's expected that they may start arriving in, in two to three months, I believe. Um, is that timeline realistic? Because it's not just about delivery of the tanks. It's also about training. It's about setting up battalions. I mean, is all this talk right now about when these tanks will get there, is that actually realistic? Do you think that's going to happen according to this timeline? So... What, what had been reported yesterday was that the training uh, of soldiers and the buildup of the um, repair facilities actually were started as of right now. So therefore, I expect and all we, we have training facilities prepared, I think, in Poland and in, in Finland and other places. Um, so and it takes up to four to six weeks, as I uh, learned, um, for, for soldiers to be trained on the on the leopard tanks. Um, the delivery, yeah, no one knows for sure. Uh, as you, I think, quoted before, um, the, the new defense minister said maybe mid and March might be realistic. Um, so it's hard to say. And as Pavel uh, rightly said, so the question is what spring looks like um, this year in Ukraine. Um, and indeed, um, so no one knows, but, but at least they will start uh, immediately with building up all the facilities because it's way more than just delivering the tanks. It's also about munition um, and uh, all this re reconstruction repair facilities uh, on the ground. Uh, Teresa, President Biden has said that this move should not be seen by Russia as a, an offensive threat. Um, but when the U.S. tanks uh, arrive and, and when the German tanks uh, arrive, at what point 
does this have the potential to become a, an open and direct armed conflict between the West and, and Moscow in Ukraine? Well, I think everyone is very cautious about that. I sit here in Brussels, and clearly it's not NATO getting involved with this. European member states or other European states are getting involved by uh, sending support to Ukraine. So it's not a NATO-led uh, initiative. So that let's make that clear. And I think that, you know, we see Central Eastern European member states completely um, uh, supportive of Ukraine, sending whatever they can. Estonia was sending howitzers just to, to show and try to shame Germany into sending or agreeing to uh, send the leopards. So I think that um, it really depends where you sit in Europe, how you see this. And I think uh, we should also, you know, look at it in a positive. You can look at the glasses half empty or half full, but the fact that Germany finally did come to this decision, I think, is really a very important sign of continued support for Ukraine, but they need even more than what's being sent, like 14 leopards isn't going to do the trick. And so um, I love that word, the Russian word for General Mud, Rasputitsa, that Pavel was speaking about, about how difficult it is to fight in the muddy spring. Uh, there have been, you know, there's a great deal of concern about where Russia is going to get these troops. Uh, are they just going to, you know, there's a clear issue of lack of morale. Uh, the Ukrainians have fought better than anyone imagined. They're highly uh, motivated, and maybe that they can even scope down the, the training period for the use of the tanks. But they really do require a lot of things that they are to win, not just survive. So I think that there is a new feeling uh, that after the Ramstein meeting that they have to win, not just you know carry on indefinitely. And I think that the longer this goes on, this whole kind of China-Russia um, uh, alliance of convenience, mm -hmm. however you want to describe it, it is going to hurt China over the longer term. Uh, Olaf, you, you spoke earlier about how difficult all this was for Chancellor Schultz politically. Um, at some point in the last few days, he acknowledged uh, that many Germans are deeply concerned by this decision to send tanks to Ukraine. I want to speak for a moment about how much concern there is in Germany uh, about this and where public opinion stands on it. No, absolutely. He made uh, yesterday an appearance in front of the parliament and he closed his statement in which he then announced that Germany will send the 14 uh, leopards to Ukraine by addressing directly to the German people and saying, I am fully aware of your concerns and I take this very serious. So and there you can see that um, he has a very good feeling. Uh, maybe he's a bad communicator when it comes to his allies and, and uh, political coalition partners, but at least so the people are backing um, this. And if you and there was an interesting switch in public opinion. So while around the Rammstein meeting end of last week, so there was a lot of criticism by newspapers and others for why is he not um, saying a word and why is he not explaining himself? So and over the weekend, actually, that changed. And more and more commentators and also people on the street I had talked to said, I actually appreciate that he's not rushing into this because mm. we're really afraid of ending up in the next war uh, with Putin. And you can see this also it's a very german domestic debate what but the conversation here at the beginning we talked about defensive weapons versus offensive weapons so weapons are weapons so you can do anything with them so but it was very important for the discourse here to say okay we are delivering weapons and that was in the very beginning of the support for ukraine mm -hmm. last year in february march saying we are not entering a war. We are not interested in escalation. So mm -hmm. we're just giving them defensive weapon. They can defend themselves. With the Leopard tanks, of course, yeah, they have been delivered. So mm -hmm. President Zelensky made that um, specific uh, um, sentence saying, we will use this. So he gave a special interview to mm -hmm. German um, state TV and said, we will use your Leopards only to defend our country. We are not mm -hmm. intended actually to attack Russia or so. This mm -hmm. is important for the German discourse, and this is, of course, uh, a short constituency, to be honest. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Pablo Felgenhauer, Teresa Fallon, and Olaf Bönke. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.